Now, alone again, Chess applauds Alice for her quick thinking. Although, if you ask me, it wasn't so much if Alice is quick on her feet and more like Chess literally spelled it out for her and needed to spell out his explanation a bit more. Alice then reflected upon this for two pages before she reached the solution. Hello and welcome to Pecantation Points Video Snark. If you came here because you thought that this was an audiobook, please stick around and maybe learn some reading and listening comprehension skills. I read books and discuss what went wrong and how they can possibly be fixed. I'm continuing my read through of The Wonderland Trials by Sarah Ella. Not the first video, go check out the others. Links are posted below. Chapter 9. The story is that Charlotte was arrested for being an unregistered Wonderlander. Alice angrily asks the headmistress if this is some kind of terrible prank, but then immediately keeps reading the article. Alice takes up back to Charlotte's apartment, where she confirms that everything is as she'd left it that morning. I'd also like to remind you that it's barely been an hour since Alice left. She randomly wonders if they'd come to get Charlotte during the night, but almost immediately dismisses the idea because Alice would have heard. Dina comes in as Alice is rifling through Charlotte's stories. As she stares at the cat, Alice randomly thinks of how Charlotte would always say something about, You never know when a few extra minutes will get you out of a bind, or the secrets a new hour might tell you that the previous one's concealed. Her port screen then buzzes with in incoming messages, and for a moment, Alice thinks that it's her sister, despite logic telling her that Charlotte hates technology. However, it's not Alice's device that's going off, but for some reason, Charlotte. It's randomly Maddie, and Alice thinks about how she'd heard Maddie's voice talking with Charlotte the night before, but Alice can't guess the security code to unlock it, so she only gets snippets of the messages. Alice goes back to her room when she trips over an old clock of theirs that had fallen into the ground, but then she notices that there's a tiny keyhole. She takes out the key chest had randomly given her, and naturally it fits perfectly and unlocks the clock. Inside, she finds a map of London before the Queen went batty and destroyed the kingdom. But there are odd locations on it labeled as Heart Palace, Tall G. Woods, and Pool of Tears, which Alice had never heard of before. There's also an envelope addressed to Alice. In it, Alice finds Charlotte's birth certificate that confirms that Charlotte is not only positive for the Wonder Gene, but it's also where she was born. Her soon name is also Spade, and she was likely born to Lord and Lady Spade. There's also a wanted poster with Charlotte on it that makes Alice question if Charlotte had condemned Alice when she was a child. Alice dismisses the idea quickly, despite suddenly realizing that the girl she once thought of as her sister was literally living a lie. If Charlotte would lie about being Alice's sister and being normal, what else has she been lying about? Alice tries to recall the last memory of her parents, but it's her. She thinks that there were gardens, like the ones she saw in the windows in her dream. And the sense. But mostly, Alice clings to some memory of eating sweets. This sounds sad to her because they weren't given sweets at the foundling home where she and Charlotte lived, and the headmistress at the school was stingy with pudding. And finally, finally, Alice admits that everything she ever thought of was true was a freaking lie. And I have to say, I know that I've been trashing on the book for how poorly that has been regurgitating the Alice in Wonderland source material, but for once the author actually bothers to move away from it, it's honestly not bad. However, I have a feeling that the readers have to suffer through much more of this half-chewed regurgitation with zero understanding from the author what makes Carol's works such an enduring classic. Chapter 10. The sudden realization that Charlotte wasn't who she claimed to be shook Alice to the core, so much that Alice had been questions of the validity of the birth certificate, which is good because you should question everything like that. But then she goes too far and wonders if Charlotte even knows how to read, which she almost immediately takes back because you simply can't fake that level of enthusiasm for reading. Alice had intended to give the book to her sister, but since Charlotte is gone, she instead sits down to read it. Despite the title, the interior of the book seems to be about the history of various card games and board games, which, wow, color me surprised. Not. Between the entries about the various games, there are little poems. Most of them are familiar to Alice. One of them is The Wallace and the Carpenter, which I'd like to remind you was already named dropped as the illegal gambling den, but whatever. Alice starts to reset the first verse of the job rocky to Dina. The cat doesn't like this much and has a bad reaction, but as Alice stares at the page, she thinks that she sees something. She wants to stop flipping through the pages, but finds that she cannot. She keeps telling herself last page, but then turns to the next one and said, she also keeps getting weird vertigo and nausea, but blames it on her glasses. As she sits there, she thinks about resetting the crocodile poem with her sister, and then, as if thinking about the memory was somehow not good enough, the narration that has to actually put the poem into the book for us. Gah. Once she turns back to the book, she sees that certain letters in the crocodile poem have been underlined so that it spells out hearts are wild. I also looks back at some of the other entries, but fails to find any hidden messages like that. And let me guess, that's a password to get into the tidy layer Wonderland trials. 
Allison randomly decides to take the book jacket off and discovers that the book isn't titled something about monarchy or whatever it was, but rather the adventurer's almanac. She also sees fingerprints at the corner of the spine and randomly declares that they're her fingerprints after literally one second. I don't even know anymore. There's not even an attempt to be subtle. I open the cover again, this time focusing on the scribbled inscription and cursive just inside. To my darling Shirley, I read out loud, best of luck in the trails this year. I hope this book will help you find your way. Alice has no idea what to do with this information, so she, so she decides that she's going to listen to another podcast. I'm guessing because she thinks that it's going to somehow solve all of her current problems or something. I don't know. Anyway, the podcast has Maddie talking about previous winners of the Wonderland Trials. She starts off with Scarlet, who is the first ever winner. But then a decade earlier, there was a girl named Shirley Spade who was practically guaranteed to win. She would have been named as Charlotte's successor, but she disappeared in the fourth and final round, which Maddie says isn't unusual at all. Alice thinks that Charlie Spade is actually Charlotte. And considering the birth certificate Alice found listing Charlotte's actual name as Spade, I don't blame her for that thought at all. Alice looks back at the book again and finds the description with All My Love, R.S.H. As she's wondering who R.S.H. is, Dinah knocks the book from Alice's hand. They fall to the floor and a card with the official seal of the Queen of Hearts falls out from between the pages. The letter is addressed to Alice from Scarlet, explaining that she wants Alice on the team as a wildflower, and that the requirements of providing birth certificate to prove Wonderland or Jean has been waived, and, but that Alice has to get to Wonderland before midnight of April 30th or else she'll be disqualified. Also in the envelope is an ace of hearts with the famous Francis Nicole Riddle written on it. Why is a raven like writing dust? Alice shares in my opinion about the riddle and how it's not exactly the best for helping to guide people to the end destination here. Dinah then starts to talk to Alice, but it's not until Chess shows up that Alice figures out that she's dreaming. Quick on the draw, isn't she? But it isn't the fact that my cat has transformed from feline to female that has me tripping backwards over the coffee table. The implication that cats cannot be gendered? I don't know what this is supposed to even mean. Anyway, Chess introduces Ace to his grandmother, Detective Dina LeFin. Dina complains that Alice is rather slow in the take, which is fair. Chess referred to Blanche as White Rabbit too. Strange. You literally told us the first time Blanche showed up that her name was White Rabbit. The fact that you said it in French doesn't even matter. Gah! Why is this book so infuriatingly bad? Then there's this bit where Dina and Chess say a lot of stuff, but literally none of it makes any sense, which, considering Chess's word salad from the illegal gambling den, I don't know why I'm so surprised over this. Finally, Dina picks up one of the Wonder posters from the table and says that we've never recovered one before. I'm not quite sure that I follow this. Alice immediately asks if Charlotte kidnapped her as a baby. Dana says that they don't know who or what Alice is. Dana goes on to say that every year they lose somebody in the trials, specifically during the last part as already established. Chess Chess acts like he might have lost somebody when he participated last year. When questioned, he confesses that it was his little brother, Kit, who was 14. He complains that he doesn't think that the age is high enough and that 13 and 14 year olds are too immature for the trials. Dina then tells Alice that she has a preposition for her and then says that it's time that somebody finished the fourth trial. Chapter 11. The three of them are interrupted before Dina can explain any further by the headmistress showing up. I don't know how much time has passed, but it had to have been quite some time. After all, Alice discovered the truth about Charlotte, flew through the book multiple times, and had an entire conversation with Chess and Dina. Why is the headmistress only now showing up? Nothing quite like showing up 15 minutes late and without any Starbucks. Anyway, the headmistress acts all concerned about Alice's well-being, but has shown up with other people. Alice can see their shadows under the door and can hear their feet. Little wonder she showed up hours later. Later, she was busy getting the police, although why they wouldn't have grabbed Alice at the same time as Charlotte is beyond me, but I've given up expecting any sort of reason in this book. Then a jumble of activities takes place, one on top of the other, like a house of cards falling into its doom. Literally pick any other metaphor, please. Anyway, Dina turns back into a cat and Chess disappears completely. As if the readers are simply too stupid to put it together, Chess is the Cheshire cat and the last thing to vanish is his smile. The guards start pounding on the door, which is completely and utterly at odds with the headmistress begging to talk with Alice. I get what the headmistress is going for here, to lure Alice into a false sense of his security and get her to come out. But the problem is that you cannot do it at the same time that there are literally guards who are trying to break the door down. Alice begs for help from Dina and Chess. Chess gives her some nonsensical advice, but that apparently does the trick. One page of literal word salad as Alice muses this over and she's suddenly... 
I'm going to put question marks until the author comes back and actually uses some sort of coherent words here because I don't know what's happening. Why do I feel like I should have gotten high before attempting to read this? As I keep saying, Carol's words are often viewed as whimsical and nonsensical. This is literally incoherent garbage. It's like the author picked random words from the dictionary and strung them together with propositions and hoped for the best. In the end, Chess basically tells Alice to simply believe in herself. That's literally the only difference between being normal and being a wonder. That Wonderland is somehow fueled in one's belief in, again, going to slam the question mark button until the author comes back to explain herself. Alice randomly decides to drink tea before she remembers that if Charlotte was allergic to it, she wouldn't have kept it in the house. But for some unholy plot-filled reason, Alice kept the tiny vial of it in her bag. Right as she grabs it, the guards break down the door. The name of the guards, you literally didn't ask? Didum. Yep, yeah, gotta shoehorn in every single character. I'd also like to remind you that she hasn't even gone to Wonderland yet. I'm almost afraid to ask who's left for the actual trials. Alice downs a sip of tea and shrieks down, but to the eyes of the headmistress, it's like Alice vanished. After a moment of searching the apartment and confirming that she isn't there, the three of them leave. Now, alone again, Chess applauds Alice for her quick thinking, although if you ask me, it wasn't so much if Alice is quick on her feet and more like Chess literally spelled it out for her and needed to spell out his explanation even more. Alice then reflected upon this for two pages before she reached the solution. Anyway, Chess gives her something to make her the right size again. As she gets larger, she inhales Chess's scent, which officially confirms that he is the love interest. Ugh. Dina breaks this up before it can go anywhere and tells Alice that she's got two days to get to Wonderland. And normally I would complain over how little time she's been given, but bro, we're 11 chapters into this, over 120 pages, and Alice hasn't even been to Wonderland yet. If you ask me, two days is too much. Chess and Dina then warn Alice that the trails are dangerous, which, no kidding, if people routinely disappear from them, of course they're dangerous! Chess also tells her that it takes time to find your mastery and that she'll need experience. Alice tells him to show her, because this is exactly what everybody wanted to read before the actual plot gets started. A training montage. Ugh. Chapter 12 on a train, Chess explains to Alice that tea is a magic potion to Wonderlanders, that every different ingredient affects them differently, but that the stuff he gave her to turn her the right size is actually a basic cure-all for any tea. Alice then asks why he'd given her the key, to which she explains that Charlotte gave him the key first to give to Alice one that time was right. Alice's inner narrative explains that in the hours since she and Chess escaped the headmistress, he's explained to her that Alice keeps glitching in and out of Wonderland, not simply in the previous chapter, which, yeah, Glitch is a good word to use for that scene, but probably not in the context that I'd use, but basically her entire life. It's a lot easier for Chess to have access to her via her glitched out Wonderland dream, so he was actually talking to her when she did the cliche eat me, drink me scene a few chapters ago. Alice lies down in the sleeping bunk of their private car and gets frustrated that she could be doing more than glitching. She expresses frustration over the riddle, although let me tell you that knowing the answer to Carl's actual riddle, the answer is honestly kind of silly, but what else is new? There's this bit that feels so awkwardly out of place, I have to wonder if it was accidentally copy-pasted into the wrong spot. Chess asks Alice about virtual reality, which in this dystopian future is considered old technology that is no longer in use. Alice wakes and Chess says that she was only in Wonderland for 30 seconds. He does some stage magic while telling Alice to believe in herself. As usual, this takes up too much page time while somehow contributing literally nothing to the overall plot. Finally, Dina speaks up for the first time this chapter, reminding us that she's there too. She says that the key to finding out what happened to all the children in the other trials is to uncover what happened to Charlotte as well as where Alice came from. Alice then randomly shows them a spade card, as if neither of them have ever seen a spade in their lives, and says that she remembers seeing a guy with a spade tattooed onto his hand, which I feel like the author has 100% put the cart before the horse with this one, because... Who is this man and what did she see him doing that was somehow so relevant to Charlotte's past disappearance that it sparked a memory in Alice? Was there literally not one single editor to help fix this book? Also, as usual, the idea of this bad guy having a spade tattooed onto his right hand is laughable, especially when you remember that this is a book that revolves around deathmatch card games, especially when you remember that spade is supposed to be Charlotte's actual surname. Chess asks what's significant about the man with the hand tattoo. In this book's preferred style, Elle stumbles around before literally handing the plot over on a silver platter without actually struggling or needing to work for the answer at all. She's certain that the man is Charlotte's father. 
Alice offers up Charlotte's birth certificate as proof. Although if you ask me, I'm still hella confused over where this man with the hand tattoo even popped up. Did Alice see him when she was a baby yesterday? Who knows? Not the author, that's for sure. Shash isn't certain about what Alice is saying, except that the problem is that Alice isn't exactly saying anything. She's simply resetting facts that the readers have known for a couple of chapters now and randomly pulls something plot relevant out of thin air. But his concern isn't without reason. He was on Team Spade last year. His coach was Mr. Spade. Kit was the player who disappeared, who was also on Team Spade. So if Mr. Spade is making people vanish, why would he intentionally vanish a member of his own team? After Chess reveals that they're going to London to meet up with Maddie, Alice uncovers a whole new layer of lying and depravity Charlotte had kept from her. Charlotte knew about Alice's misadventures in the illegal gambling den the entire time. She'd asked Chess and Maddie to keep an eye on her. This was because of some sort of bizarre idea in Charlotte's mind that if she let Alice do what she wanted, then Alice would somehow be easier to control. Yeah, I don't get it either, but whatever. Moving on. Did you know she wasn't my sister? It wasn't my truth to tell. Now here's the part that I don't understand. Chess openly admits to not knowing about Alice's situation the entire time, but that he was working with Charlotte to cover the entire thing up and keep Alice in the dark. What does Alice do with this new information? Completely and utterly nothing at all. One reviewer on Goodreads compared Alice's personality to that of unbuttered toast. I'd also like to add to that she's got the personality of a doormat too. Chess literally told her that he was in on a plan to keep Alice's isolated from her truth for as long as possible, and Alice calls neither of them out on it. Instead, she literally sits and mopes about the entire thing, like the wangst-filled brat that she is. Personality? <laughs> what personality? Her personality is the author desperately trying to pretend like Alice is a strong, quirky, independent female protagonist and feeling harder and harder with every passing page. Liter Since literally no plot has happened for the last page and a half, Chess fell asleep. With little else to do and Dina's presence in the car apparently had been completely and utterly forgotten by the author, Alice pulls out some audio files Dina had given her earlier. Since Dina is a detective, they're all about her investigation into the missing Charlotte Spade, or rather after Charlotte was spotted in the normal world. She says that Charlotte was seen having meetings with Blanche with Charles Alice, so Dina is suspicious since Charlotte was the only missing child who has resurfaced, but after having spent some time with Charlotte and her young charge, aka Alice, Dina begins to think that there must be something else at play here. After the clip is over, Dina asks Alice what she thought about it. Alice asks why Dina didn't simply take Charlotte back to Mr. and Mrs. Spade, but Dina says that she needed to observe Charlotte for a while, which is in reference to her last comment on the tape about how there's something bigger than one missing girl suddenly showing back up again. She also says that she's positive that Charlotte and Alice know something, which is why Charlotte worked so hard to hide Alice all these years. Alice asks Dina that she's leaving to go after Charlotte, which Dina agrees. She disembarks a train, leaving Alice alone with Chess. Thanks for listening to my book circuit on YouTube. New videos are up every Monday, but stick around because I sometimes drop random videos on other days too. Just as a reminder, even if you can't financially support me, there are other ways to help me out. The first is watching this video as well as all of my other videos. It's also important to like and subscribe. Finally, you can share this video with all of your friends so that they can help as well. If you're already caught up with all of my videos, you can go to Tumblr for my main book snarks, always free and updated every morning. And if you've read all of my main snarks, you can find even more snark on my Patreon. You can access it for $1 a month. Members also get early access to my main Tumblr snark. Special thanks to Dawn, Phoebe, and Nikki for supporting me on Patreon already. If you want to hear your name in my video next week, either support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation. Do you like my snarks so much that you want me to snark your writing? I do that too. For just $6 per chapter, I will tell you how awful that your writing is. But not to worry if you feel like you couldn't take the criticism. I also offer regular book editing as well, just one cent per word. You can contact me on any of my social media platforms if you have further questions. If you want to read some of the things that I've written, you can purchase my works on Amazon. I have a slew of erotic short stories and two full-length novels. I also frequently run flash sales on my stories, and if you aren't following me on any social media, you might want to do so just so you can know when I might be offering things for free. Links for everything will be posted below. See you next week, guys!